Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this much anticipated launch of Paths to Prevention, the California Breast Cancer Primary Prevention Plan, and for being the very first public audience to learn about this groundbreaking effort. So I am Amanda Heyer. I am the president and CEO of Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. And for the last three years, and with generous funding from the California Breast Cancer Research Program, BCPP has been working on a new, highly forward-thinking approach for moving the needle on preventing breast cancer. So you, should, you all should have received an email with a link um, to our website where the executive summary and the full plan are posted. So I hope you take some time to dig in after today's conversation. So while this strategic plan was built for California, we believe that this groundbreaking effort can change the way that we approach tackling breast cancer nationwide. We're so grateful that all of you are here today with us now to celebrate this milestone achievement, because truly it is only through the support of our community that we were able to, to take on this endeavor and to mark this particular moment in time. I especially want to thank CBCRP for making this report possible and this effort possible. And I want to thank all of you, our supporters, for your commitment to our central mission of preventing breast cancer. And as well, I'd like to give a warm welcome to any of you who are new to us today. So if you're learning about BCPP for the first time, for over 27 years, we have been, lead we have been the leading science-based policy and advocacy organization working to prevent breast cancer by eliminating our exposure to toxic chemicals and radiation. Our focus is at the intersection of breast cancer, prevention, and environmental health. So a little bit later in the program, I'll give you a good sense about how you can help us sustain our critical work and help launch and make real this incredible vision that we'll be discussing today. So stay tuned for that. So just a couple quick housekeeping notes before we begin. So we we'll to make sure we get everything covered. So all participants will be muted, but please go ahead and use the chat function um, if you have any technical questions. And then as our speakers are speaking today, if whatever questions come up, go ahead and put them into the Q&A function because at the end, we'll have plenty of time to get to most of your questions. And for any questions that we can't get to, we can always follow up personally via email later. Um, and so with that, without further ado, I am so excited to welcome our incredible speakers today for today's event. So we have Nancy Burmeyer, our very own BCPP's Senior Policy Strategist and the plan's Principal Investigator. Nancy works at the state and federal levels to advance public policy to reduce exposures to toxic chemicals. And as a PI on this project, Nancy has overseen every aspect of the development of paths to prevention, which was a huge effort. So we're so glad to hear from Nancy today. And then also we have Sharia, Sharima, sorry, Rasanayagam, BCPP's Director of Science. Sharima oversees our science-related activities to ensure that everything we do at, at BCPP continues to be um, a leading nationally on science-based environmental health advocacy and is deeply rooted in, in scientific evidence. She was deeply involved with the massive, this massive project and really gathering and summarizing the science for paths to prevention. Again, an incredible effort. And as well, I'm so excited to welcome our special guest and partner in the community, Jan Robinson Flint, who is the Executive Director of Black Women for Wellness, a women-centered community-based organization working on reproductive justice issues as they impact Black women and girls. BCPP has worked with BWW on a number of issues, and we're so excited to have Jan join the advisory committee of this project and really help spearhead um, the community engagement act, um, process involved in the plan. So um, we're excited to hear from all of them. So thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to get us started. Nancy? All right, let me get unmuted here. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you again for joining us for this exciting launch of this groundbreaking plan. I just want to give you a little bit of background about the plan. Um, we set out to identify the risk factors related to breast cancer, review the available science, and then make both policy and um, research recommendations to both better understand the risk factors and create population level interventions or actions from the local to statewide, from the legislature to school boards and businesses to reduce those risks and therefore the incidence of breast cancer in our state and beyond. 
And I wanna just echo Amanda's huge thanks to the California Breast Cancer Research Program, which not only helped fund this, but were partners throughout this process and helped us immensely. Next slide. So let's start with how this plan is different. Almost all states have what they call a cancer control plan. And it looks at a number of issues like access to care, um, uh, screening, those kinds of things, uh, treatments. But what they don't often spend a lot of time on is what we refer to as primary prevention. Rather, if they do talk about that, they usually talk about what individuals can do to eat better, exercise more. And we took a very different approach in this plan. Um, our focus is solely on primary prevention, so stopping the disease before it starts. And then we focused on systemic interventions. Instead of telling women to eat better, how do we look at ways to make healthy food more available? Instead of telling women to exercise, how do we make sure that they have safe and clean places to do that? To sum it up, I will quote our, our future panelist, our uh, panelist you'll hear from in a minute, Jan. And her, the quote from her was, make the healthy choice the easy choice. So again, this was population level helping women to find ways to avoid these risk factors and try to avoid trying to reduce risk factors that they have no control over, like chemical exposures. We made a very conscious decision from the very beginning that we were going to look at this through a social justice lens to make sure that we, that the policies we recommended impacted the most vulnerable among us and those that are most overburdened with the array of risk factors that have to do with increasing breast cancer risk. And while it was certainly relevant and important at the time, and in fact has always been relevant and pertinent, it's even more poignant now as our as our country faces the racial reckoning that has come from police brutality and, and the killings at the hands of, of police. So we were very, so we're very excited that that is the lens that we bring into this. And finally, we made a decision to weave together not just the peer reviewed science, but community wisdom. There's a wealth of knowledge on both what are the problems and what are potential solutions in the communities who live these issues day after day. And so we made a, a really conscious decision to bring those into the mix so that we had a plan that's sort of more relevant and um, rich as we roll it out to the communities um, that we hope to engage in implementing it. Next slide. So to hold us true to those principles, we created um, a set of guiding principles to make sure that we could check ourselves along the process and, and stay true to our vision. Um, so breast cancer is a societal issue. This is not about individuals. It's about how do we make population level change. Um, we must address discrimination, racism, and, and inequities in power and access so that everyone has um, is able to make those healthy choices and are protected from those exposures that increase breast cancer risk. Talked a little bit about the community wisdom, which is a source of information that often isn't highlighted or covered in scientific research. Um, breast cancer is multifactorial, so the interventions must be multifactorial. In fact, breast cancer is not even one disease, it's not numerous diseases. Um, so we need to make sure that the recommendations we put out there address um, lots of different aspects. And we do not need 100% certainty to act. Um, so that's a really important sort of taking a precautionary approach to this because we know what happens if we wait for 100% certainty, which is a lot of people get breast cancer and other diseases. Next. So we put together this plan by bringing together a number of different input, in, um, inputs. So the advisory committee was an amazing group of individuals from mostly from California. We had academics, we had community leaders, we had labor folks, we had, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, um, labor folks, um, we had public health experts, and we had some state and federal agency folks. Um, we then did the scoping reviews of the science, which Shreema can talk about a little bit, looking at all the science we could find about these issues and, and 
looking at specific aspects like how do these issues impact different um, women of color and other kinds of vulnerabilities like that. We did a series of study groups where we were able to dig in on specific issues, bringing together sort of cutting edge scientists working on the issues with community um, activists who are leading efforts to reduce those, those cancer, breast cancer risks. So we did those to glean more information and more ideas, and that was a more national audience, um, whereas most of the work we did in California. The community engagement piece was my favorite piece of the project and the one that I think brings the most um, unique aspect to this plan. And you're gonna hear more about that from Jan in just a minute. And then we also looked at intervention research. So this is peer reviewed science that looks at what interventions have, have been effective at reducing different risk factors. So a lot of it looked at the more traditional risk factors like physical activity, tobacco use. Um, and that research is not limited specifically to breast cancer. It's in fact, mostly about other kinds of health endpoints, which all of these interventions will impact other, other health um, endpoints. So we wove that all together and then we went back to both the, the advisory committee and to a group of community leaders to make sure that we got it right. And then we pulled it all together and created this wonderful plan, Paths to Prevention. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Sharima. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. It's an exciting day for us all here at BCPP. So I wanna give you a little bit of an insight into some of the, the, the scientific review that we did. Um, as Nancy said, um, we, uh, we worked with our advisory committee and our community advisors. And we also started off with what we call our seven foundational documents. And these, so we're not the first people to look at breast cancer prevention. Um, there are some uh, great organizations and reports that came before us, um, including the President's Cancer Panel uh, report on uh, environmental carcinogenesis from 2010. Um, the uh, Institute of Medicine uh, looked at breast cancer in the environment in 2011 and 12, and then the Interagency Breast Cancer and Environment Research Coordinating Committee did a great report called Prioritizing Prevention that came out in 2013. And we used those seven documents, a bunch of others, and all the details are in the report that you have a link to. Um, and we used those documents as the base from which we looked at to see what were the risk factors we wanted to examine um, and, and use those as the science up to that date, which was 2013. And then we did uh, a set of scoping reviews, as Nancy said, uh, which is where we looked at the literature from 2012 through 2019 and pulled together all the most current information on these risk factors. So we came to these risk factors that we looked at, and there's 23 that I'm gonna go through in a minute. Um, first through looking at those foundational documents, but then talking to our advisory committee. And then also we got a number of risk factors from the communities themselves. We said, this is what um, a particular one was, the impact of stress on breast cancer. Um, the community said to us, yes, um, we've heard about chemicals, we've heard about smoking, um, but we're really concerned about stress. So we included that in our scoping review of what is it that's, uh, impacting breast cancer rates in the state of California. Um, as I say, uh, we, there's all these numbers. We, we did a, a big screen of the literature um, and the methodology again is in the, uh, the full document. Um, if you want to know all of the keywords we use to, uh, to, to search through the literature, let me know. But finally, we had over 2000 articles that we read completely and tabled the data from and used to figure out which risk factors we thought were relevant. Uh, next slide, please. So when you open the book, there are three sections. We divided the risk factors into three. three. Uh, there's the factors that influence and provide context to all others, and these are really overarching issues. Um, and these were race, power, and inequities and social and built environment. And aspects of these two huge areas affect everything in, in our health and, and environment. Um, 
then we had a set of factors for which we had sufficient evidence uh, on their uh, impact on breast cancer to suggest real interventions. Um, we arranged these factors alphabetically. We didn't try and weight one against the other. And uh, it says alcohol to, to tobacco, but you'll see all the ones in between when we go to the next slide. And then we had a number of factors where there may not have been quite enough research to link it directly to breast cancer, um, but um, that there were enough there was enough evidence to raise a concern and for these it's mostly we're asking for additional research uh, but also many of these factors there is enough evidence to link them to other health effects next slide please so hopefully you can read this and again this is all available online as well but these were the full list of risk factors that we looked at um, as a, and we arranged it kind of like a clock at the top we have the two overarching ones race power and inequities and social and built environment. And then as you go through, first we have um, going from alcohol through tobacco, alphabetically, those where there is sufficient evidence of a link to breast cancer and real interventions in our uh, document. And so I'll go through them. Alcohol, um, breastfeeding, uh, which is a protect protective factor, um, chemicals that you find in consumer products, um, diets and nutrition, ionizing radiation, um, light at night, non-ionizing radiation, um, occupational exposures, uh, the use of pharmaceutical hormones, um, physical activity, again a protective factor, um, place-based chemical exposure, um, pregnancy related factors, and tobacco. And then on the important but uh, needing more research uh, factors, uh, the effect of ambient noise, which could be connected to light at night as well, um, body weight throughout the lifespan, um, which is important, but uh, varies depending on the life stage uh, that uh, the body weight is looked at. Uh, breast density, which we know is connected to breast cancer. We're not quite sure how. Uh, we're not quite sure what interventions would be appropriate. Uh, inflammation, um, uh, ages of menarche and menopause. Um, the microbiome, this was a topic that came from our advisory committee, is something we needed to look at and hadn't really been looked at before in, in, these, uh, in the foundational documents at least. Um, stress, as I say, which came from the community, and vitamin D. So again, as I say, these, these factors uh, probably need more research to link to breast cancer, but there, for many of them there are um, indications that they are linked to other diseases as well. Um, and so in total, uh, our interventions, we have 330 policy uh, interventions in this document and uh, over 85 research recommendations. Uh, I'm now going to pass over to Jan to talk a bit more about our community involvement. Thank you. And I am so pleased to be here and so impressed with the breadth of this document and wanted to talk a little bit about why I thought it was important to have a community voice and how I happened to get involved. Uh, one day, several years ago, I uh, woke up and checked Facebook and in my Facebook feed, the first five folks uh, were people who I actually knew and they were all people, all women who had experienced and survived breast cancer. And I just thought at that point when I was looking at that, this is an epidemic in my community. It was all black women. Then our office manager at Black Women for Wellness, who was 39 at the time, uh, had three children that she breastfed, was diagnosed with third stage breast cancer. So it, it really occurred to me that something is going on and we need to begin to look at the environmental aspects of what's going on with, with breast health and breast cancer and move to a place where we are truly not blaming the victim for the crime in this instance. Because when I was looking at Willie, that's her name, um, there was, in looking at her risk factors, she shouldn't have been diagnosed at 39 with breast cancer. So when this opportunity to, came along to include a community voice, I was like, yes. And this is what 
what I know about community voice is one, um, that we are truly not uh, well represented in the scientific community and not held in high regard. But that did not happen with this process. Uh, and so I'm very happy about that with Breast Cancer Prevention Partners that when they sought out community vo voices, they sought out community voices. And I'll put that voices there to really emphasize that our, we have diverse communities and um, that no, none of our communities are monolithic in terms of we have different social economic status, we have different education, we live in different neighborhoods, and we have a common experience that I was looking at and that common experience was around breast health. So, um, so it was good to be able to, uh, to include a wide breadth of community folks and to be able to um, travel the state of California in including that wide breadth of community voices. Next slide. So in traveling the, the state of California, um, I actually got to participate in the Los Angeles Listening Circle, and I really appreciate Listening Circle as opposed to Focus Group, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, and also in Tracy. <clears throat> so I got to go on a couple of road trips with this crew as we traveled the state uh, to listen to what women had to say. One of the things that we know uh, about folks is we have different styles that we listen and that we share. And what I appreciated about this is how we use different techniques and tools in listening to women. So not only did women get a chance to articulate and tell us what they thought, but we also walked around the room and looked at all of those different areas, alcohol, tobacco, water, et cetera, and we're able to write our thoughts down. We were able to break up into small groups and we also shared food. So that really gave, I believe, the women uh, who participated an opportunity to fully participate, to bring their whole selves uh, to the experience and uh, that what they wanted to say was value, right? Which is one of the reasons why I even mentioned water. Uh, the folks in Tracy really talked about the water and the water situation um, that was going on there. And a lot of times if we, go into a conversation to say, we want to talk about breast health, uh, we don't bring in water. We don't bring in some of those other extenuating circumstances that, um, that are Ill impacted women and that are on their mind and that they want to talk about. So through, through listening, through speaking with, through writing, through sharing food, we spoke to women at 11 locations and I feel like it was like, was it 137 women that we talked to or more uh, about what should we do? What would, what would constitute prevention and what would constitute intervention? Um, and then part of that also was to develop common language and what we were talking about. Next slide. So, um, and this of course was all uh, led and helped with a community advisory board. And that picture is some of us from the community advisory board. And it was, um, it was very interesting just in terms of the community advisory board and how we came from different perspectives. There are folks there, where there were women and men on the advisory board. There were academics, there were formerly incarcerated. There were a variety of women of color and um, just different perspectives. And we had to uh, really tussle with uh, issues sometimes in terms of how to get it right or how to be respectful, how to let people maintain their dignity and how to let people get the input where it felt inclusive as opposed to exclusive. So, and that was a, a constant question that we asked ourselves, are we being inclusive? Whose voice do we need at the table? Whose voice is missing? And are we listening well? And I am hoping that we got it right. Um, when I opened the slide, or when I opened the link with the report and saw how many pages it was, I realized that we included 
a great deal of the thoughts. It is over 300 pages. Um, and I certainly am going to look for the cliff notes as well as the executive summary. But I'm hoping that with all of that, that we were able to be inclusive of the many voices, the many communities uh, that are in California and come up with solutions that will lift us all as opposed to leave some out. And um, looking forward to feedback from that, that community as we begin to read portions of it and to see if our voice was heard. Thank you, and I'm turning it back over. Thank you, Jan. Um, really appreciate that. And we, we could not have done this without you. And we had a lot of fun doing it, too. So um, thanks again. Um, so I want to dig in on a couple of different issues. As Jen said, there were over, there's over 300 pages. There's over 300 interventions. And we don't have time to go through all of them. So I want to look at three different um, issue areas that happen, which happen to be the ones that the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners focuses on the most. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A later. I also want to note that um, it is a huge plan and we do have an executive summary and we did provide, we have provided the, the executive summary in Spanish as well as English. So we hope to go back to some of those um, participants who, for whom we had translation at the listening sessions where they were needed. Uh, and make sure that, that they get to see the result as well. So in terms of place-based chemical exposures, uh, I, I just want to pick out a couple of different interventions, sort of one that's currently underway, and then a couple more that um, folks can look at, you know, we can look at from a statewide level or a local level um, to show you the breadth of the kind of interventions we included. So one of the things we wanted to do was reform how the state exercises oversight over industrial pollution. And that's done by an agency called the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Um, and there've been a lot of issues with that from the EJ community feeling like that agency wasn't responsive and transparent enough. And I'm happy to say that there was a bill in the state legislature this year that passed and is currently sitting on the governor's desk that would create an oversight board to provide some more of that accountability and made some other changes in the agency to try to, to make it more relevant and more responsive to the communities that are most effective. So that was one of the things we put in there that is actually hopefully almost, uh, almost done. Although the implementation will take a lot more work moving forward. Um, so a lot of communities in LA actually, you know, there's basically a fence between people's homes and an oil extraction well. And, you know, all of the chemicals that are associated with that can be a huge risk factor, not just for breast cancer, but for a variety of other issues. So we could pass state legislation to require a buffer zone between where um, those oil oil wells are allowed to function or to operate and communities and schools and a bunch of, you know, and other vulnerable locations and places. Um, we could also look at municipal ordinances that would restrict or eliminate the use of pesticides in public places like parks and recreation, recreational fields and public property. Sometimes those pesticides are used for purely cosmetic reasons. And, you know, the, on balance, that's in our mind, not worth the risk to people's health to make the lawn look pretty. Next slide. Chemicals and consumer products is an issue that the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners has worked a lot on. And we've worked with Black Women for Wellness on a number of issues around cosmetics and personal care products as well. We've co-sponsored legislation and efforts together, and they've been great partners on that. Um, Again, one of the things that's underway is an effort to try to disclose the hazardous fragrance ingredients in personal care products. While personal care products have labels that list a number of their, um, most of their, well, list ingredients, there's almost always an ingredient called fragrance. And that one word is not one chemical. That can be a mix of a dozen to over a hundred different chemicals. And we have never had access to what those chemicals are. And this is the first time anywhere in the world 
where we actually will get information that's publicly available through the California Safe Cosmetics database to the hazardous chemicals, so chemicals that are on authoritative lists of endocrine disruption or allergens or carcinogens. There's a whole series of different lists. That also has passed and is currently on the, the governor's desk for signatures. So again, we're hopeful that that piece will be um, dealt with soon. And of course, when you disclose chemicals, it encourages companies to take them out because they don't want to tell you that they have formaldehyde in baby shampoo because it turns out women don't want to put products with formaldehyde in them on their baby's heads. So it's not just transparency, it's also a way to make those products safer. Safe disposal of products containing hazardous chemicals like perfluorinated chemicals is a, is a huge issue. And that's, you know, there are a lot of chemicals out there like these, these perfluorinated chemicals, which are referred to as forever chemicals, that just don't break down in the environment. So we need both policy and research to figure out what's the best way to dispose of these. Let's not incinerate them in communities that already have an over burden of chemical exposures, because then you're just going to pump that crap out into the air that people have to breathe. Let's not put them in landfills that are right next to, to um, those communities as well. So what's the best way to make sure that products that aren't safe don't end up what we call downstreaming into vulnerable communities? So that's a big issue that um, we'd like to work on moving forward. And then another option that, again, the more local level would be instituting precautionary principles in the products that communities or that different um, agencies buy. So what are what cleaning products are the school systems and the cities buying? Um, you know, what are daycare centers using? How do we make sure that the products and the and the basically the buying power of these institutions pushes the market towards safer products. So that's again, something that can be done on a, on a city by city, county by county basis. Next slide. Finally, I wanna look at occupational exposures. Uh, so I mentioned perfluorinated chemicals, the for, forever chemicals that's used in Teflon and stain resistant products and waterproof products. They're also used in firefighting foam and those foams are used to put out liquid flammable, well, flammable liquid fire, fires. So oil fires or gas fires, they use these foams. And those foams are required by federal law to have PFAS in them for certain uses. So for instance, on airports, they have to use foam with PFAS in it. But the municipalities don't have to use them and we're hoping to change the federal rule soon. Um, and Unfortunately, when they use these foams, not only are firefighters exposed to these really toxic chemicals that are linked to various different cancers, including breast cancer, kidney and liver problems, neurodevelopmental problems, um, but so they expose not just the firefighters, but the runoff from these foams have contaminated the water of, I think the estimate currently is about 19 million Californians. And because they never go away, once they're in the environment, it's virtually impossible to get them out. So again, we have worked with a bunch of our colleague organizations to pass a bill here in California to ban those use and require the use of safer, effective, and affordable alternatives to these really toxic um, foams. And again, because it's been a pretty good year for us legislatively, it's now sitting on the governor's desk. So again, we're hopeful that we can get that one through this year and start reducing the use of these um, incredibly toxic products. Uh, another thing that we could work on fed, uh, statewide would be to remo remove PERC, which is a, again, a toxic chemical. It has a link to breast cancer and it's used in dry cleaning. And again, there are safer alternatives available and those are exposures not just for workers, but sometimes for the communities around them if that, those chemicals are not contained. And, you know, you're bringing clothes home that have been cleaned with this toxic chemical, so it can be a exposure for consumers as well. And then finally, we could work on establishing ambient air pollution standards to protect outdoor workers. And I don't know about where you all are, but here it's like night in the middle of the day because of the level of smoke from 
the California fires. Literally, it's dark outside. And, you know, for people who have to work outside, it's really important that they be protected either by not having to go to work or at least being provided uh, the personal protective equipment necessary to protect them. And this is something that one of our colleague organizations, WorkSafe, has been working on for quite a long time and they are continuing to try to get state le regulation passed to provide those protections to those workers. And again, those outdoor workers are sometimes the most vulnerable around us. One of the things that we've also been concerned about is after the fire leaves and there's cleanup, we send day laborers, domestic workers, and a bunch of other folks into these burn areas to do the cleanup without any training, without any personal care protection, personal protective equipment, and expose them to potentially really toxic exposures and or toxic chemicals. And there's been very little study on that. And it's something that I think a lot of people are really concerned about. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview. Um, and while those are some of the things we could take on, um, you know, there's a lot of different pieces to this. And I, just to talk about next steps for one second, you know, we need to continue to disseminate this, get this out there, create smaller chunks of information. So if you're interested in place-based, having a fact sheet on that particular issue, pushing the report out through the media. We want to do a series of webinars including one for state legislators and you know looking for places other places to disseminate this and begin the hard work of actually making this plan real thanks thank you nancy thank you sharima and thank you jan so um, as you can tell we're all extremely excited about what this plan means for the future of bcbp and even more broadly how it will bring together a diverse array of stakeholders across the state, across the nation, in order to unify around breast cancer prevention. So we're so excited. And from my perspective, one of the most exciting aspects of this plan is the blueprint that it provides us um, as an organization to go deeper and re to remain even more committed to using a social justice lens and framework for the work that we do at BCPP and really continuing to prioritize those communities that are most impacted by these exposures. Um, so I know that Jan has, a, has limited time with us today. So before um, we get into the broad q and I want to ask a few targeted questions. So I'll start with you, Jan. Um, so COVID-19 clearly has shown even more light on the significant health disparities and inequalities across low-income communities um, and diverse populations in our state and nation. And, you know, clearly we see the same inequities in health with breast cancer. So how does PAP to prevention address these inequities, particularly the intersection between issues like chemical exposures, the social and built environment, and racial inequality. And you know, from your perspective, how do these increase people's susceptibility to COVID-19 as well as breast cancer? That's a lot of questions in one. It is. And, um, and, and I, I, there's this old, um, African proverb that we use sometimes, how do you eat an elephant? And it's like one bite at a time. And that's, that's, what, we, that's what we are doing here. That's what we are attempting to do here. Um, as I was listening to, to the, the presentation, I was thinking about one of the things that we have going on in Los Angeles is a coalition called Stand LA, which is standing together against neighborhood drilling. And we have asked for a 2,500 foot setback from oil drilling sites. And we found that a lot of the oil drilling sites are in low income communities or communities with no power, right? They don't have that influence over the, the elected politicians and administrators that big money does, right? So, but uh, weaving together this coalition of neighborhood organizations to make that fight is one of the ways that we're attempting to eat this elephant. Right. Uh, another uh, coalition that Black Women for Wellness in BCPP is part of is Change, uh, California's for a Green and Healthy Economy. You might have gotten it wrong. But at any rate, uh, and we're the ones who keep going back to uh, hold DTSC accountable. 
to ask them to you know do their job because that is the one thing that communities must do is to demand that government does their job. So when it comes to COVID-19, we have seen the abysmal failure of government to do their job. And it is no more uh, readily illustrated that in looking at how this health crisis has not been handled and now who is suffering most from this health crisis, you know, who's being diagnosed, who's dying, and it is, it is almost out of control. Uh, just in that regard. But the other thing that has also illustrated to us is that we have many systems, right? Uh, it's not just one system. You know, we would love it if the FDA had a little bite to it. We would love it if the EPA had a little bite to it. We would love it if the uh, Health and Human Services had more bite to it. But we have seen that there are many systems we have seen the failure of the many systems, not only to work together, but to be uh, subject to politics as opposed to looking at the science or the health. So with, with this, this guide that you all have meticulously put together, or I should say that we have meticulously put together, it gives, uh, it gives strategies and tools for the many systems, as well as for the community and our many communities to hold our government accountable, as well as to hold other systems accountable for creating a healthy planet. That's what we need right now. I heard you all talk about, um, it looks like night in Northern California. It looks like that here in Southern California. All our cars are covered with ash. And you know we have to tell people if you don't need to go outside, especially if you have breathing issues, don't, right? Because it's very hard to breathe. And we're not talking at all about the incarcerated firefighters who may have, not may have, who will have chemical exposures and may have health conditions lifelong as a result of this, but will not be able to get a firefighting job once they're released from incarceration. So we have a lot of systems to work on uh, that are stacked against people of color, that are stacked against low economic people, uh, and are stacked against people who have let their power go. So um, this pathways is, you know, we need guidebooks, we need tools, and we need those tools that have a social justice lens that they have been conceived with and written with. Because if we're not talking social justice, then what are we talking about? So thank you for inviting me to, to participate. And um, I'm looking forward to sharing this far and wide, especially the executive summary. Thank you so much, Jen. We are so grateful to have you as a key partner in the, in the development and now the next phase of implementation. We're so excited to be hand in hand with BWW as we move forward on this. Um, so I know you may need to get off. I'm going to continue with some questions for the rest of our team and then we'll get to the audience questions. So um, we've got Sharima next. So Sharima, as a scientist, how do you see peer reviewed science and community wisdom working together. So is there tension here? How would you encourage other projects to take this approach? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would say that the biggest impact of this project for me um, was that synergy between uh, the, the peer-reviewed science that we looked at and uh, hearing and learning from the communities. Um, just being able to a hear from the communities what what they were most concerned about and uh, get the direction of where we 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 could look that we that had been ignored before and then working with them on what it was we were finding from the peer reviewed science presenting it back to them and then hearing from them um, from their lived experience what actually made sense what interventions could work in their communities, what they saw as the right intervention for their particular um, community. And it, it totally changed some of our outlook from me and my team sitting in 
libraries and reading dry pieces of paper to actually hearing from people on what it was like on the ground and how uh, how we could look at things differently. And I think it's when you want to make real world change, you need to talk to the people who are in the real world, hear what their lived experiences are and learn from them and learn with them. And uh, yeah, I think it's how we should do everything from now on. Um, it was a real, it, it really did uh, open my eyes as a ivory tower scientist. So thank you to everyone who spoke to me and us. Thank you. So Nancy, um, how is the plan helping to guide BCPP's current work and future work and projects? So, um, and also in addition, how do we hope to engage other stakeholders as we move forward? Great, thanks. And I really liked Jan's analogy of the, the different bites of the elephant, because there are lots of lots of different ways to come out the, come at this issue. And again, they have a lot of overlap. All of the things that the Breast Cancer Prevention Partner does are encompassed under the umbrella of this plan, um, because we do work on trying to prevent breast cancer and specifically primary prevention. I think the thing that's going to be great about this plan is how do we engage a variety of different stakeholders? This is not BCPP's plan. No one organization could ever put this together, could ever implement this. And there are a lot of people doing work out there for a variety of reasons that also could benefit from the lens of breast cancer prevention as a part of that ongoing work. For us specifically, it allows us to, to recalibrate and recommit to our commitment to working with local communities. Um, as we look to um, think about what we want to do next year, the first thing we want to do is go out and talk to communities that we've worked with on this plan and beyond, hear what they're up to, what they're interested in, and possibly come up with some specific projects, both state legislation, but also local place-based engagement um, to help reduce exposures to some of these um, risk factors. So that's a new direction for our work and a new way to envision our work. And I'm incredibly excited about moving forward in that, in that direction. Thank you, Nancy. So I'm gonna go, we do have some time left. I'm gonna go to some audience questions right now and then, and then we will close out. I have a, spe I have a special message for everyone at the end. Um, I'm so, one question from Linda. So um, where, what about air pollution? Um, how does the plan address that both outdoor and indoor? So um, thank you. Um, yes, so air pollution is both outdoor and indoor. Um, so outdoor air pollution is pretty much covered in our place-based exposures um, chapter. And then indoor air pollution uh, comes from a variety of sources as what you bring in from outdoors, but also um, mostly um, uh, exposures from volatiles coming off consumer products. So we do cover that uh, within the um, exposures in consumer products and also occupational exposures for the, where there is indoor occupational exposures. But yes, it's very important to uh, the indoor as well as outdoor. Thank you. If I could just jump in, one of the great things about this plan is that Sharima and Connie Engel and a bunch of other folks have gathered all of that science in one place. So if what you want is a scientific summary of what the evidence is, you can find it. If what you want are actions you can take to address it, you can find it. And I would concur with um, Shreema, it's in place-based, it's in occupation, and it's in consumer products. I think we have time for one more. And for those of you that still have questions, we will definitely, we can get back to you via email if you just reach out to us or we will do our best to kind of track who asks what questions and, and reach out. So um, I'm going to, um, yeah, so I'm going to take one from Ivana George. So um, I, from Ivana, I've heard, uh, I've heard about PFAS street drinking water contamination is, is a growing problem. Is there anything being done about this? So how's the plan addressing PFAS? You know, PFAS is a huge issue, not just in California, but countrywide. And there have been a number of actions at, in Washington, DC. And in fact, Linda pointed out um, when I was talking about the airline, the airports needing to use PFAS foam with, um, or foam including PFAS, 
the Congress has authorized and told the FAA they're supposed to re remove that requirement, but in fact, the FAA hasn't acted yet. So we're really working on implementation on that front. Um, but there are a number of um, policies out there looking at how do we test for PFAS and how do we get it out of water systems? How do we eliminate it from food packaging, from firefighting foam, um, and, you know, and from textiles? One of the issues is that, you know, PFAS is a class of chemicals. There's over between four and 5,000 different chemicals that fall under the category of perfluorinated substances. So one of the big pushes in all of the work around PFAS is to deal with it as a class. Let's not take individual um, chemicals like PFOA or um, PFOS. Those are specific uh, chemicals, but look at it as a class. And so how do we develop ways to test for it as a class? And how do we develop policies that say, you can't use these chemicals, any of them, because they all have the same issues around um, persistence in the environment and bioaccumulation. Um, so there are a number of different efforts going on both in California and around the country. Um, so yeah, it's a huge issue. All right, I'll, I'll do one more. So um, from Molly, I live in Maryland. Are you going to try to inform legislators from other states? So maybe we could talk a little bit about how we're, we hope to extend this nationally. Absolutely, I mean, we've always envisioned this as a model for other states. Um, and in fact, we have begun conversations with some of our colleagues from a, a, co a coalition called the Cancer Free Economy Network as well as the CDC about how do we reach out to other states and how they put together their cancer control plans to incorporate more of these issues into what they're doing. Um, so we are trying to export the, the, the focus on primary prevention to other plans and, and systemic primary prevention to other plans. In terms of specifically reaching out to Maryland legislators, you know, all of these webinars that we do are gonna be taped and available. And if, if it's something, you know, we would be happy to do a specific briefing for the Maryland legislature if there are people there who want to organize it or, and or we could invite them to um, whatever webinars we're likely to do in California, although those will be more targeted towards California legislation and current policy. Um, but we're anxious to get it out as widely as possible. So any help any of you on this call can give us to find locations to, to preach about paths to prevention, we are open and willing. Great, thank you. So I, that's all, all the time we have today for Q&A. And so again, like I mentioned, um, we will try our best to get back to those of you that asked some really incredible questions. I'm seeing a long list here. So um, before we end, I wanna thank all our speakers. So Jan, who had to leave, um, thanks to her. Thanks, thank you, Sharima. Thank you, Nancy, for everything you've done to birth this incredible project that will have a life for many years to come and an impact um, across the nation and effect on all people, um, as well as just your commitment professionally to our movement and to the cause of preventing breast cancer. So on behalf of all of us at BCPP, we are clearly inspired by this new body of evidence that will guide how we approach the primary prevention moving forward. Um, clearly for 30 years, we have been in the trenches working hard to protect you and all of us from toxic chemicals in our air, our food, our water, our products, our homes, and our workplaces. That is way too long a list of exposures uh, linked to breast cancer and other diseases. And now more than ever, as we see the impact uh, on our environment and on our health so clearly every day, our work is critical. Um, so we are so particularly excited to launch this plan now and get it in the hands of legislators and state and federal agencies um, and to use it to inform our work in the coming decade, as well as rally um, community groups to use a breast cancer lens to help uplift the social justice work that they're already doing. Um, so we're so excited about the potential in the world and the impact it will have on individuals' lives. And we cannot do it without you. So truly this was brought into the world um, as the people's plan um, based on collaboration and community 
And how fitting is it that we are now asking our community to invest and support um, to enable its, um, its sustenance and its ongoing implementation. So we are hoping that you all will invest today in Paths to Prevention. Uh, no gift is too small, any gift matters, and we hope that you'll see the purpose um, to help launch and move this forward. So we're making it easy for you. We're gonna put a link in the chat for you to donate, or you can simply go to our website at bcpp.org. Um, even if you just want to write in the chat um, that you'd like to make a commitment, Julie on our team will follow up with you and help you do that. Um, so clearly, we're counting on you all to help us. Thank you so much for those of you that have already supported the launch and those of you that are longstanding supporters of all of our work. Um, we are so incredibly grateful to you. Um, and again, I, I hope that everyone is safe. I know California and the whole West Coast is struggling with these fires and um, we're holding you all in our hearts. Um, and we are so incredibly thankful for you pri for prioritizing us today amidst all the things that we are challenged with navigating. Um, so many thanks and we hope to hear from you soon. Again, you should be able to find all the information um, that we sent via email to access um, the executive summary and when you're ready, read the 300 plus pages of this incredible plan. Uh, we know you can do it. Um, thank you. All right. Take care, everyone, and we'll be in touch soon.